I used to do a sermon on every Father's Day to dads. And uh, I stopped doing it, I think, maybe more than anything, because I think it discouraged more dads. I don't know why, but that's just my feeling. And I think probably part of the reason is because there's tension between what a dad's supposed to be, supposedly, and what a, uh, oftentimes we see our, our wives being more tuned in and doing, I think it just got to the place that I think it was a little discouraging for guys. So even the relationship between a man and a wife, that's a very hard thing to, to try and figure out, let alone how does that work in, in, with my kids, how does it work in my home, how does it work in the church. Um, and a lot of that is simply because guys are so, we're tuned different, um, but because uh, even our time just isn't as available. So I get that. So I want to start a little different, and you guys probably gotten the idea by now, I don't, I worry about the outline, but I'm not propelled by it. So if, if you're an outline filler inner, I apologize. <laughs> Sorry, our high school teachers here. If, if I don't get it, come up and I will fill in all the blanks for you. If you want to do that, I want to get it. Uh, <clears throat> but I think what I want to, want to do, I want to, I want to just um, uh, encourage you guys that this isn't a matter of uh, trying to pick on men. And sometimes that can happen. That's why I think the church ends up often I filled up with women. I mean, they don't have any problem with women, but I think the guys, because we're, we're prone to be different, we're not oftentimes talkers, we're doers. And um, I, I, I do the same thing in our church with books, but I tell you, most guys are not readers. Um, so we need, we, need to, we need to grow together. So what is really realistic? So I want to make sure that we're, we're doing that. And I thought, as I was sitting here thinking a little while ago, I thought, what I, I want to just, I'm going to use my dad as an example and just try and use that real quick and give a little thing about him. My dad was a farmer in uh, Nebraska, and... Uh, didn't get married until he was 21. I mean, he was 30, came to the Lord at 21, got married at 30, and then had 11 kids. So you can imagine uh, he was a late bloomer or something. But, um, but all I, I'm just going to say, my dad was a, a godly man. He was a man that sometimes even standing up front, Dave and me, we didn't get this, whatever this is. We didn't get this from dad. We got this from mom. Um, so just gifting us that, you know, how we all put together. My dad would never have been up front doing this. And yet my dad was one of the most godly men I ever, ever knew. My dad, uh, but he knew scripture and he knew how to apply it. He lived it. Um, obviously wasn't perfect. But when he'd get up in front, uh, even in the church we went to when we moved to California, he ended up being the chairman of their board because people recognized that. But he'd get up in front. He was painful to watch up in front. He was, he was, uh, well, I, I, I want, I want, I want is that, is that good? That was, that was kind of, that was a little better than that, but I mean, he was, he was, he got the words out, but sometimes really stumbled over. All I want to say to you guys, this is not, um, God's wired me a certain way, wired Dave a certain way, uh, but that's, that's not the expectation for whatever guy's wired like that. It's not. And so I don't want to come across saying that, yeah, this is how every guy has to be, because my experience is that is not true. So I want to try and set you at ease on that. And we're not trying to set up a certain personality type and say what they should be. On the other hand, I think we can really be beaten up and, I don't know what the word is, manipulated by some of these things going on in our culture to tell a man, frankly, that he should not be a man. There's an awful lot going on today that the new man, I'm going to talk about that a little bit, the new man is someone who is, if, if the feminism is trying to copy maleness, the new man is being told you have to be more like a female. And I, so ladies, if I offend, I'm not trying to, but let me just say this, guys, your role, you might need to learn to be softer and sensitive, but I want to tell you, your role is not to go to be more soft and more sensitive, to be more like your wife. You need to be a man. And that doesn't mean you run over her. It doesn't mean you, you know, Fred Flintstone, club her over the head and drag her off to the cave. That's not, <laughs> it doesn't mean that. And it doesn't mean whatever we call old chauvinism, but it, but it means if there's ever a time for men to grow and to be men, um, we, need, we, need to, we need to be men. And so I don't want to discourage you. I want to encourage us. 
John Piper addressed it this way. A little bit of a long quote, but let me, let me read this. He uh, said, I addressed him indirectly for a moment. Do not let the rhetoric of unbiblical feminism cow you. Maybe that was where I was looking at. Cow you into thinking that Christ-like leadership from husbands is bad. See, we're living in a world, a patriarchal society is called, that's bad, you don't want to be patriarchal. That puts the women down, the women are under the thumb of men, and that's, that's all bad in Western culture. Um, so don't, don't be letting the thing, is what our homes need more than anything. For all your meekness and all your servanthood and all your submission to your wife's deep desires and needs, you are still the head, the leader. And from Adam on, men have, we can get intimidated by various things and we pull away from that. We can be a leader at work and do all kinds, of, but get to home, like, ooh, I don't know necessarily how to do this. So, but it doesn't mean we should back away. What I mean is this, you should feel the greater responsibility to take the lead in the thing of the Spirit. You should lead the family in life of prayer, in the study of God's Word, and in worship. You should lead out and give the family a vision of its meaning and mission. You should take the lead in shaping the moral fabric of the home and in governing its happy peace. I have never met a woman who chafes under such Christ-like leadership. But now I have too many wives who are unhappy because their husbands have abdicated their God-ordained leadership and have no moral vision, no spiritual conception of what a family is for, and therefore no desire to lead anyone anywhere. So, men, I hope that this isn't, um, hope this doesn't come out as, as we're lecturing, trying to browbeat guys into being something that you cannot be. And I realize that women, somewhat by their, uh, just their whole dint of who they are as women, and by their availability, do much more of the reading and and it, there's a lot more intuition and stuff. But guys, that didn't mean you're not a leader. It doesn't mean God expects anything less of you. It may look different, and you might need that help to sit down with your wife and say, how can we work this out together? And you need to give me some help. And uh, so we work together on that. Otherwise, you know, we, we really capitulate. I think the world is looking for this. They need this. This man died a few years ago, but if any of you ever heard of uh, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, he was a um, he was a senator at one time from New York, but he writ, wrote a lot before there was a sociologist. He says this, from the wild Irish slums of the 19th century eastern seaboard to the riot-torn torn suburbs of Los Angeles, there is one unmistakable lesson in American history. A community that allows a large number of young men to grow up in broken families, dominated by women, never acquiring any stable relationship to male authority, never acquiring any rational expectations about the future. That community asks for and gets chaos. I thought that's prophetic. Man, that's, what's, that's what we've been watching on the news. It's exactly what we've been watching. In such a society, crime, violence, unrest, unrestrained lashing out at the whole s social structure, these are not only to be, ex these are to be expected. So, um, Guys, your role is, is your role is pivotal, and uh, it's going to look different than the role of your wife. And God has given you the abilities to do this in the in the um, calling. He's given you the abilities, so you're going to have to work at that depending on the personality of your wife and your personality. Again, I'm not even suggesting uh, this kind of stuff. Getting in front is not easy for many, but it's a lot easier than it is for a lot of guys. A lot of guys, are you kidding, man? I never, I never do that. I'm not saying you should, so I'm not equating this to leadership, but I'm saying in your home, you need to look for how God has prepared you, and there's an ability you have to lead in your home. And so, um, so we need to learn how to do that. There's a guy by the name of David Blankenhorn who has written a book, a number of books on, on family and stuff. He wrote one called The Fatherless America, in which he lists a number of these different models that our culture has come up with. One of those is the unnecessary father. If you may, it, this was written a number of years ago in the time of Murphy Brown. So that's 20 years ago. That's a long time ago. But in that debate, it was, you know, what is really necessary for a husband to be and a man to be. And basically, it was like, we don't need men. Uh, we don't need fathers. A gal by the name of Annie Lamont, who's even got some traction recently in evangelical circles. I can't figure out why. A lot of people are quoting her. She's proud of the fact she had this adopted little boy she brought in. She said, Operating Instructions, a journal of my son's first year. 
I'm just going to have to tell him that not everybody has a father. Look at me, I will tell him. I don't have a father, and I don't have a swimming pool. Okay, having a father is like having a swimming pool. You don't need either. <laughs> um, but Sam, her son, will have a tribe. You can't help but believe that these other men will help Sam not have such a huge sense of loss. They'll be his psychic secret service. Three years later, when his daycare worker comments to mom that her son talks about dads a lot and gets depressed when all the other kids get picked up by their dads, then this article, Miss Lamott thinks nothing of it. She's willing to sacrifice her own son on the altar of her philosophy. Some people, he goes on, Blankethorn goes on to talk about the old father, which is the, he says that, the, you know, just do it my way. It's the chauvinistic dad that I'm just going to, just follow me. And just because uh, he talks about the new father, the one that is trying to, you know, do everything, emulate a woman, be soft and sensitive, that loses its way after a while. So, okay, those, we can go over that. So I'm going to go back and I want to, now to get in the outline, I want to just talk about the role of a man, how this works out. Uh, so first thing we see is, in, in going back to Genesis now, is he provides leadership. He said, well, uh, you don't see that in Genesis, but you've seen that in the passages of 1 Timothy we saw about. There was a primacy to his leadership because he was created first. That's what Paul says. So, gentlemen, it's not a question of I'm going to have to inherit or work for this role. That's what God says your role is. The man was created first, and he had a job to do. What was his job? Naming all the animals. He had a job to do before he was ever created. So there's something about that that tells us God has given this responsibility to, to a man exclusive of his wife, exclusive of, of a woman. So, but if we're talking about a husband-wife relationship, we certainly understand that it, it starts there. And so that's God's plan. We need to see also man's problem. We know that we mentioned something happened in Genesis um, 3, and it's interesting to me, we pointed this out before, interesting to me, Satan approached the wife. And again, I don't know if we're not told. Um, maybe it would have been different, and we can't play these games, and God's sovereignty, what he did, he did what he did. But he didn't approach Adam, and I like think, well, maybe Adam would have stood up. Maybe he would have said, no, not the way it is. Um, but the problem is that he did not stand up. And he was judged for that, and going back to Genesis 3 and verse 17, one of the first things that God said to him, okay, guys, one of the first things that God said to Adam is there's this curse, and he says, it's because you have listened to the voice of your wife. Sorry, ladies. <laughs> Need to be encouraging, helpful, but that was Adam's problem. He first listened to the voice of his wife. We're not told the conversation. Maybe it was, honey, what do you think about this? Isn't this a delicious looking fruit? Well, we don't know. Honey, what do you think about this? Mr. Serpent here says we should take. He said, yeah, okay. Yes, dear. Our second daughter told us a long time ago, she, how old she was, but she said, I finally figured out when mom says, yes dear to you what she really means i said what is that she really means you stupid idiot so we figured that out <laughs> yes dear <laughs> so be careful what you say your kids know what they really mean <laughs> that's not my wife but we thought that was funny and she thought it was true so i don't know <laughs> so the issue that doesn't mean you don't listen to your wife but it means guys god god did not equip you to get all the instruction from your wife it means you know, carve it out yourself. You know this stuff, okay? Now, for your personality, your type, who you are, your gifts, okay, what does this mean for how am I supposed to do this? And so it'll, it, it's what that... Um, and it's interesting to me that man's problem then was worked out. Part of the curse for Adam, and see, for men and women, we need to understand that part of the curse for Adam was what? Estrangement from his wife. That was part of the curse. 
Hers is pain in childbirth, desire to dominate him. But Adam's curse was estrangement. So I think that probably details, Romans 5 says we all inherit the sin nature from Adam. So I think probably what happens there, guys, I think that that, you know, however you got married, you fall in love, you see her, you know, your heart skips a beat, you know, okay, I want to bag this woman and hang her on the side of my den as my trophy. I got her. And then what happens usually, and then a man's off to work. He's off after other trophies. Got my wife, okay. I literally had a guy one time tell me, ask me if he ever said he loved his wife, and he looked at it and said, well, I said that, yeah, the day we got married. Haven't changed. It's 15 years previous to that. You wonder why in the world the woman is sitting there starving for love. He thought, well, I said it 15 years ago, isn't that enough? Um, so that estrangement that you feel is not unnatural. What that means, men, it's not a matter of you feeling inadequate. It's a matter of saying, okay, I get this. It's natural. So what am I going to do about it? And I need to take charge. I need to say, for me and for my wife, I need to, I need to address that. And some of the hardest things you can do is start looking at that. But that was part of what happened for him. We know about part of her curse, but that was what it, I think that's what it meant for him is this estrangement from his, from his wife. So then we've talked about the, the provision that was there. Provision was what? The provision was not fig leaves, temporary covering. The, the provision by God was the skin of an animal that's going to cover their shame. Now, can I then take that concept of what God provides and can I go over to the New Testament now? If you want to follow along, we're going to go over to Ephesians 5 and I want to work through some very foundational stuff from Ephesians 5. Talk about what God provides, man, for you, what he provides for us. In the context in Ephesians 5, um, the context is all being, the, the context is um, walking in the Spirit in Ephesians 5.18. is where that begins. Don't be drunk with wine where it is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. So, man, this is, that's kind of one of the, Gen generating thesis that run through this whole passage, being filled with the Spirit. And so that's, that's, where, he, that's where he starts. But then uh, the way this works out is um, am I in the right book? Yeah, there it is. Uh, <clears throat> in 318 it talked about don't be drunk with wine, but then he says, speaking around their psalms and spiritual song verse 21 be subject to one another some people say well that's the operative manner it is be subject to one another we get that and there is a mutual submission but then it goes on wives the implications are very solid wives be subject to your own husbands for the husband is the head of the wife that's where i want to park again you're the head of the wife now there'll be a lot of people if you read any theological journals which i'm not expecting you to do they will look at that verse and the word is kephale and they say well kephale really doesn't mean head let me just tell you kephale means head <laughs> it, it's a shortcut it does every place that you use you're the head it means this part it means that you're not all the body and I, but you're the one that's to think process and you're the ones to give direction to the rest of the body that's your family um, you're the one that's given the responsibility before God to say okay whatever happens out of this family I want my family father by the way men your family will probably go your way. No matter what you do, they will go your way. You don't find churches, you don't find churches filled with men, spiritually single men. You don't find it. You find churches filled with spiritually single women. women. They know the Lord, they want to follow God, but guy's not there. Um, and it's, it's terribly difficult to do that, but what you will see happen is, is the guy will set the pace and whatever happens to the family, good or bad, will c come from you. That doesn't mean a woman can't do that on her own, but it means it's much more difficult. And so the idea of being ahead, being the leader is something you just need to know. God has invested you in that, and that's what he, he expects um, from us. And again, I'm going to go back to this idea in 1 Timothy 2. That was from creation in 1 Corinthians 11. Uh, head of every man, uh, every, uh, Christ is head of every man, man's head of a woman, and God is head of Christ. That diagram 
we, um, we gave, and so we need to understand that's a model I have to fulfill. I'm not going to look for the other models of headship and say that's what we get from our culture. The culture will get you some kind of a model like to be a, a sports nut. Um, that's where you're going to spend your extra time. Hey, I like sports as much as anybody, but God didn't call you to spend all your time building your fantasy football league. Nobody has to raise hands. Not, not condemning it. I'm just saying we don't spend all of our time doing that or you know, all the other models that are out here. Um, leadership, if I can say this, is understanding your wife. Let me give the verse on this. First Peter 3, 7. Here's what it says. You husbands likewise live with your wives in an understanding way. Now, that means you got to understand your wife. Uh, well, I understand her. All she wants is my checkbook. I don't think that's it. Um, I don't know what it takes to understand your wife, and, it's very di- and it can be intimidating for a guy to really say, what makes her tick? It's, <laughs> God made us different, and it's, it's frustrating because most of us guys, you'd like to, if you can't fix something, you want to go out in the garage and get a 3 8 socket and come in and, <laughs> and it's fixed. <clears throat> Doesn't work that way. When you start exploring that, it's going to be either a tirade or she feels like she's been there before and I don't know because I don't know if I'm stepping on dynamite and if I do he's going to get angry and he's going to retreat so I don't know how to do this. It's very hard. It, it can be some hard work to live with your wife in an understanding way. Uh, either that or it will be tears. How many men love to see your wife in tears? <laughs> uh, we don't. So it's, that's, it's hard work, but so it says, live with your wife in an understanding way. As with a weaker vessel. Now, that doesn't mean any way, I think, except physically. Unless she can out-arm wrestle you, she's weaker, okay? Some of you maybe can't, I don't know. But you get that, he's saying, she, since she's a woman, she, it calls it weaker than you are. You can dominate. You can strong arm. That's why even if the wife goes out and takes the kid to church and the guy doesn't go, he'll still, I don't, I'm not going to follow my wife. I'm going to do what I want to do. Because you're the stronger one. And she's weaker. You need to understand. You need to call it soft and sensitive or whatever, but you need to spend the time understanding what's going on inside her heart and life. What's her aspirations? What's her fears? What's her dreams? How are we doing together as a couple? Not getting intimidated. Well, she says, you know, you were only home two nights last week. Um, and the kids need more of you. Okay? What does that mean? Um, is it a season? Is it a time? So you got you to... Gotta, and understand that'll mean, that'll mean questions about personality. It has nothing to do with spirituality, guys. Some are more talkative than others. Um, like I think talkative and quiet probably are opposite of tracks. Introvert, extrovert. If you're an introvert, your wife is probably more of an extrovert. Um, if you're gregarious and outgoing, she is probably not. And so you may need to spend some time working. What does this mean to, to understand in this way? And why should you do that? You need to do that since she's a woman and grant her honor. And see, here's one of those New Testament passages. Ladies, this is also for you. Grant her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life. She's as much in that ballpark as you are. And so she's a fellow heir of the grace of life. And you do that. I know most of you don't have your Bibles open, but you know what the end of that verse says? You are to understand your wife in this way since she's a weaker vessel so that your prayers may not be hindered. Boy, I mean, that's, that's an astounding thing. I think what that means is you understand your wife so that your prayers won't be hindered. <laughs> I don't think it's that hard to understand. I think that means you sit and pray and they'll just bounce off the ceiling if somehow you're not spending the time to understand your wife. Uh, that's not rocket science. 
that's hard work, but that's not rocket science. And that's going to take some, that's going to take some hard times. That's going to take tonight, tomorrow, next Tuesday night, I don't know, whenever you say, hey, what would you think about what that guy said down there? And she'll go, what guy? Well, you know that McNaff, you know, not the old guy, the younger one. <laughs> we do know who is older, don't we? <laughs> you too. Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> okay. We are older. But you go home, you say, you know, what, what about John said? What do you think? How are we doing? Do you feel like I understand you? Oh, go ahead and ask it. It's okay. She, if she's nice, say, um, sometimes. Okay, when not? And you guys, it's in, it's intimidating, but have the conversation. What are you, what are your? You know, when you get married, you have this idealism. You 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 think you're married. You realize, on the course, your life probably married like four or five different people. The person that stood beside you and got married changes. There's a girlfriend, boyfriend, then there's an early married, and then there's a have a kid married. And all of a sudden, you've got this other squalling thing that takes more time than you get. And then you have two or three squalling things, and she's forgotten about you. You change. And you have to spend time remembering, by the way, those squally things grow up and leave, and you'll be left with each other. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> I enjoy the empty nest. <laughs> Mine are gone. But you've got to, to get to there, you've got to spend the time doing now. And it's harder to do when you're where you're at, when you have little kids running around. It's harder. But take the time to do it. Live with her in that understanding way. Um, now, let me go on. Because if you don't, let me give you another one. Ephesians 6, 4 is another talks about leadership with your wife, understanding your wife, and then for the guy it also means leadership. And can I say this, and not provoking your children to anger. Not provoking your children to anger. So here's the second area of leadership. Understand your wife, and then Ephesians 6, 4, fathers. And some people say, well, that could be euphemism for parents, and certainly it's there, but if Paul wanted to say parents, he could have said parents. He says fathers. Fathers. Do not provoke your children to anger. I, I think this is applicable. I'm not sure uh, why this happened, but, but when, you, when you spot a guy in the NFL on TV and he's just done something great and comes back over and the camera pans on him, who does he say hello to? Mom, why don't you say, hi, Dad? I think it's because Dad, to some extent, is still sort of an intimidating figure. He remembers dad watching him in Pee Wee, and he got two hits. We said, what happened to that third one? He swung at a curveball. I told you not to do that. So, and the kid can grow up um, being provoked to anger because he doesn't measure up to dad's expectations. Guys, we, we want to live through our kids. That's why the whole sports nut thing is, uh, sports is not sports. Sports is not sports anymore. Sports is everybody's preparing for the NFL. Everybody thinks their kid is a genius. Everybody's going to get a scholarship. Um, no, they're not. <laughs> Just tell, no, they're not. They're going to enjoy sports, but we've got this whole thing going. So what does dad do to provoke his children to wrath? Let me give you some suggestions. Number one is the control freak. Um, <clears throat> Dad's going to make a chart for everything the kid does. He's going to control his agenda. He's going to note his failures. He's going to chart a course for him. He's going to um, tell the kid that I'm, he generally wants to help his kid, but um, he would be more critical of the things the kid does wrong than he is encouraging what the kid does right. I think I, I, think I finally dawned on me when my son was, I don't know what he was, probably 20 or 21, I was having one of those difficult conversations with him and I thought I was just trying to give him some helpful little advice. I don't know if anybody else, I, I, it's harder for a son to take helpful little advice from his dad than I think it is for his, so now I've just learned, you go tell him. <laughs> 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 you 
No, but you need to have those conversations. And here's the thing I figured out, I think. I think, and I told my son, I said, Pete, you know something? 90, 95% of who you are and what you do, I'm just, I'm just incredibly proud of. But I find myself, I'm looking for this little bit over here, this 5% or maybe less, and that's what I'm talking to you about, and it probably comes across you like I'm indicting the whole thing of who you are. And that's not it. Yeah, and then he came back with, yeah, Dad, I think you're trying to control everything I do. Wow. Is that your perception? I, I didn't think I was, but a dad can be a control, control freak, try and control all the kinds of things that their, that their kid does, and that can provoke them to anger. Here's one that I hope we don't have to say, but it can be the abusive dad. The dad that can, and maybe not even physical punishment and verbal beatings uh, to get his own way, but that can be. The kid can end up sullen, silent, no Here's joy. Here's another one. How about the, the passive dad? You know, perfect passive dad was David. Not this one. Passive dad is David in Scripture. Here's a guy for God's own heart in Scripture. <laughs> the whole thing about family and everything. So you remember the story, Amnon, his son, uh, has a full sister by the name of Tamar. Tamar is seduced, excuse me, Tamar is seduced by Amnon, her half-brother. He gets the hots for her, wants to, oh, and then he's, I'm sick, come in and tend to me, comes in and rapes her. Dad had to know that. Had to know that. Didn't do anything. Absalom, her full brother, gets wind of it. Doesn't do anything now, but then has this big gathering of all brothers and sisters, siblings, family picnic, and kills his half-brother. You think Dad knew about that? I think Dad would have known about that. Did nothing. You remember the rest of the story. What happened with Absalom? Absalom grew up. He was banished. He wasn't dealt with. He was banished. He was angry and bitter. And I don't think it's any coincidence that Absalom was the one that came back and tried to throw his father off the throne. Because his father was passive. And his father would not deal with the sin of his son when he saw it right in front of his eyes. Guys, one of the most difficult things to do can be to, to deal with discipline problems <clears throat> when you need to. And hopefully you do not need to, 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 to that extent. But you need to be the one that, that's doing it. That doesn't mean your wife can't discipline. But there's something about even the, you're larger, something about the voice. You need to be the one. Now, if you're angry and you discipline, you better back out. Remember, discipline is not punishment. Discipline is discipline. Discipline is guiding. It's not punishment. So if you're going to slap the kid around, I'm sorry, that's not discipline. That's punishment. That's your temper. That's not discipline. So when I say that, and we can go down that a little bit more, we're not, that's not our purpose here today, talk about discipline. But you need, you need to know that the passive dad will take the authority to come into a, a child's life, and you need, to, you need to be the one that's not just say, yeah, sick them, go mom. You need to be the one that's involved in that with them. Your, your sons, your daughters need, need to hear your voice you need to see your presence, and you need to be involved in that. You cannot afford to be passive dad. That doesn't mean that you have to exercise it all. But I tell you, when it came down to discipline, my mom could discipline, but my, my, mom, could, uh, my mom could wheel a switch as good as anybody. But when my dad did, believe me, it broke my heart. I, uh, after one of those escapades in the police department, dad stayed home and worked the next day. He came upstairs. And he was crying as he came up the stairs. I was 14. And told me to stay home from school. He stayed home from work. So don't forget, he just bailed me out of jail. So he comes up the stairs. He is, sits down the bed. Big guy. Rough guy. Hands that just, you know, like boards and calloused and cut. from. That's just who he was. But his heart was broken. He sat down and said, I don't know what to do with you. And um, I said, I don't know. So we had that exchange. He said, well, I do know. He knew the Bible. <laughs> My mom and dad loved these verses. <laughs> the blueness of a wound cleanses away evil. <laughs> Beat him, he will not die. 
Look it up, it's in Proverbs. <laughs> I thought she was lying first time she heard that. It's in there. And I know, and I know if you've got some kind of background, so you'll probably think this is child abuse. I, I took some counseling training one time, told this in a group, and the guy took me aside and said, were you abused as a child? And I said, no, I wasn't. My dad proceeded to spank me at 14 years old. And inside of my mind, I'm thinking, that SOB ain't going to break me. See, that, that SOB ain't going to break me. And he started laying it on in a proper way with a paddle. And you know something? He broke me. He broke me. After a while, I was crying not just because it hurt, but I was crying. It did a genuine work of discipline in my heart that I think those kinds of those kinds of instances kept me out of prison. Kept me out of prison. I'll tell you the other thing they did is one night after I'd been out late and came home having imbibed some and snuck in and, and mom didn't know where I was at and I came home and come in the side of our house. Dad worked two jobs. He worked as a security guard at night. He gets home around 12. He comes in and I sneak in the side. They didn't know I was home and I hear my dad talking then I hear him crying. And I kind of put my ear by the door and then I, and I can hear my dad, I hear my dad praying my name. God, I don't know where my boy is. Will you protect him? So it's the combination, you see, of that, that heart attitude and that strong arm and this kid that needed to be broken. That's what God used in my life to keep me out of prison. I don't doubt that at all. So, man, I'm not saying, I hope you don't end up with a kid like me. <laughs> I hope you don't. If you've got a little one that's like that, invest now. Do those things now. And you're living a whole different climate. If you told that story now, if you did that now, you'd probably be arrested for child abuse. So I'm not, I'm not advocating going home and spanking your 14-year-olds. Please don't. In this world, <laughs> that's probably not going to work. Uh, but see, just don't be passive. That's, don't be passive. If you, your children, your, your, your sons, your daughters need you to be involved with them. They need to know your broken heart. They need to hear you praying for them. I blew it off a lot, but I knew my mom and dad were praying for me. And we need to hear that. I don't know where I'm at. Mr. Cool, next one. You if you're trying to be your kid's best friend, forget it. You will grow, if you're the right dad, you'll grow up and you will be their best friend. You will be. But if you're trying to be your best friend to your 11 or 12 year old, eh, 13, 14, eh, maybe not. Don't worry about that. You be the right friend. Don't worry about being Mr. Cool. Absent dad, sports, pa sports dad, that kind of thing. Okay, that's the last two. I do, want to, I do want to go back, one, and I want to talk about, go back to Ephesians 5 now and just kind of lay some more things with the, the wife because I think that's critically important. Uh, stuck the kid thing in the middle of that, but really it should outline be in the whole context of what's going on. Because I do want to finish out some of those comments before from Ephesians 5 about his wife, and I did in a different Roman room. So Roman room 2, he loves his wife, and that's a spirit-filled love. Uh, Go back to this. We said that this is part of what it means when he is filling, being filled with the Holy Spirit. Men, uh, I hope that you even pray for your wife. Let me give you a little clue that, that I think would keep everybody out of marital counseling. I can almost guarantee that if you'll do this, one thing, one thing, write it down. You don't have to write it down. It's not hard to remember. I'd say this. <clears throat> Learn to pray together. I get, there's nothing more that Satan wants you not to do as much as pray together. Now he said, oh, I've never prayed out loud. Well, I know, maybe you haven't. But if you won't have anybody, and that might be husband and wife, you won't have anybody in this world that would love to walk through those woods with you, if you will, like your husband or wife. Uh, yeah, I'm, I never prayed out loud. That's okay. It's hard because it's spiritual. It's hard because Satan doesn't want you to. But I will tell you this, I don't think God has made a man's heart or a woman's heart that will not melt to some degree when they hear their spouse's voice praying for them. 
I, I, there's nothing, nothing like that. And however often, wherever you do it or wherever, <laughs> start building a pattern. How can we do this? And if you don't <clears throat> say, okay, here's a way to do it. Sit down, chairs facing each other, knees touching, join hands. Okay, who starts? I don't care, I'll start. And pray. You know what they're going through. Say, God, I pray that would you help my wife with this? Would you help her with me? Help her with our kids? And just start praying for them. Then the other one turn around and pray for them. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to, just as much as I can give a guarantee in anything, you build a practice of doing that, and uh, you don't have to read all the books. God will soften your heart. God will do things in your spouse's life if you take time to do nothing more than that. And um, so that's, that's, that's part of the spirit-filled love. That's what, that's what love wants to do for the other person. Second thing is sacrificial love. <clears throat> That means, okay, when am I going to learn to give up for her? Verse 25 said, we love our wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Jesus didn't love us because we were lovely. Jesus loved us because we were sinners. You may have to overlook some things in your husband and wife to love them. You probably will. What are you going to sacrifice to love your husband, to love your wife. Guys, I'm talking to you right now. What are you going to sacrifice to love your wife? Maybe it is, maybe it's her domineering spirit. Maybe it's her greater knowledge than you have. Maybe it's her condescending attitude towards you. Maybe, <laughs> we're keeping track back there. <laughs> John, John's raising fingers. He's getting, I hit them all. It's, it's all of us, you guys. I mean, that's 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 who we're made of. So, so we're not alone. Um, you may have to get. You may have to just plow through that and say, "Okay, get that." But that you do that. That's what you're. Okay, I'll 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 sacrifice knowing that, and I'll continue to pray for you. And some of that may be some of the things you're going to have to sacrifice your own ego to say, "I'm going to do this." You may have to sacrifice your time. Um, but it's a sacrificial love. But in doing that, it's also a sanctifying love. Uh, you guys, your love is something that God has put us in this kind of context so that <clears throat> the Holy Spirit uses us in each other's life to make us more holy. The, God uses us to shape our husbands and wives. And because we're not meant to go through this on, all on our own. We're meant to have a partner. And if you begin to pray and just ask about what God would have you do in those lives, you'll, that's part of the sanctifying effort. You know, Romans 5 says that when we were still in our trespasses and sins, Christ died for us. When your wife was still in her trespasses and sins, you married her. She wasn't perfect. Don't expect her to be perfect. Part of your job is, okay, she's still in her trespasses and sins. But I, my, part of my job as a husband is to be a sanctifying influence for her. That doesn't mean you have to go out and teach a Sunday school class or do a Bible study or whatever, but for her, that's part of your role and her for you. That's a pretty sobering thing. <clears throat> Let me give you two more. <clears throat> did I get that one mixed up? Did I do carrying her? D is purifying love. I did sanctifying, then purifying love. Um, after saint, the idea of sanctification make her holy and I think that purifying love is, to, is and I know this sounds weird but part of your process you are making her holy as you are drawing her closer to God that's how you do that you're cleansing her and how you do that by the washing of water with the word so if you want another clue pray with her study the Bible with her, uh, ask her questions about what God is doing in her life, how this passage applies, what does it mean, uh, washing of water with the word. It's not your words that are going to change her. You're not that bright. <laughs> None of us are. But the washing of water with the word will, and you don't know what that will do for her. Like she doesn't know what that will do for you, but that's part of the sanctifying process. 
And then the last one is simply uh, caring love. Husbands ought to love their own wives as they love their own bodies. So, whatever you do to take care of yourself, I mean, you'll love your wife more than that. Um, I want to read one thing in closing that's, uh, it, it sounds like a funny source. Anybody remember Ann Landers? Dear Abby, dear, you probably, if you're younger, you may not remember. It used to be advice columns in the paper. Uh, Ann Landers, wrote, they were real people. They were twins, right? Abby and Ann were twins, had these advice columns. So I'm not saying she's a great theologian. But, man, here's one of the things that I think you'll sense as you grow older. I think that you'll sense as your kids grow up. Your wife doesn't, she might shop at Norsons, but I'm going to tell you what she really wants is you. She really wants you. She wants your time. She wants your devotion. She wants you. And there's no substitute for time in doing that. And you give her time, you give her you, you will have a, you will have a happy wife. This idea, I copied this years ago, but I've used it, and I think it's helped. It was just called, Please Come Home Early. Um, this guy says, this is the most unreasonable request ever made by my wife of almost 40 years. She didn't make this request often. It came mostly on Saturdays, Sundays, and holidays. <laughs> But it seemed I always had so many things to do in spite of her gentle urging, I rarely came home early. I don't want to give the impression I was never at home. I was home a lot. We rarely did anything out of the ordinary. We enjoyed the kids and then the grandchildren. We listened to music, read the paper, had meals together. Sometimes we would just talk about how the day had gone. But now I know why she asked me so often to please come home early. She wasn't just lonely. She was lonely for me. When she passed away a short time ago, I learned firsthand what loneliness is all about. Have you ever thought, you ever thought how life ends bitterly? Life ends bitterly. One goes first. Man, that's hard. My dad had a stroke and lived for six years. My mom took care of him and died. Man, that was hard to watch mom live by herself. I have a supportive family and many good friends. I'm free now to go places and do things, but I'm lonesome. I'm lonesome for her. Now that she's gone, I found the time to come home early, but there's nobody to come home to. There's nobody to do those simple things with, such as watching the evening news, listening to the paper, or listening to, listening to the paper, listening to music, reading the paper, and nobody cares how my day went. If I should get the call from the good Lord to please come home early, I won't fight it. It's a simple little sentiment, but all it does is simply saying that spending the time together, and I know right now you guys are all right in the throes of it. <laughs> Man, I, we're not. We're, 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 we're fancy free and we can go, and I'm not even sure if my kids know we're gone right now. <laughs> We have no kids to report to. The, they say the happiest day in your life is the day the last kid leaves home and your dog dies. We don't even have a dog right now. <laughs> Nobody knows we're gone. But you're right in the middle of it. And you spending this time, and guys, you're the one that I think has to take the lead in that. You're the, it doesn't have to be expensive. I know that in our early years, I mean, going out to our anniversaries were at Carl's Jr. It doesn't have to, it's just time. So guys, you spend the time. These are, I haven't given you anything, I haven't given you anything deep. It's profound. Spend time, pray with your wife, read scripture with her. Just be, be with her. So I hope you do that. Okay, here we go. Time again, but take a few minutes for some questions or comments or corrections. Somebody asked me to break if I could be corrected. Yeah, I can be corrected, so... That would be easy to do. How about, how, how did you, some of you guys carve out time to be away? Anybody got some, what do you do when you do that? Thought I saw an elbow there in Jason's side. I don't know what that meant. Well, that's okay. I get the drift of that, but wow. <laughs> Other questions?
questions, comments, we'll pass by Jason's comment there, okay? I, th I think what happens, I think, I think women are more, I think women are more prone to spiritual things. It's just, I think. And what happens, that's why, that's why marrying is so important, because when you have a young couple in front of you, and she is, drags a gay that doesn't know the Lord, you want to tell them, listen, you getting married isn't going to change that. <clears throat> By God's grace, he might. But I think what happens, I think women as a whole, I think, are more spiritually minded. I think it's harder for a guy to really commit to that. And so often that's what happens. The guy doesn't have... And I think a lot of times because church is perceived as soft and sensitive and squishy and I don't think most guys relate to that. So I think what happens, or maybe guys don't know the Lord and they say, I don't have time for that. I don't know. But I think that's part of why. I think more women are prone to be more spiritually minded and the husbands are not. And church can kind of be perceived as that. So part of that's a mystery. I'm not sure. But I don't know what all the rest of you experiences, but that's been my experience. I think more churches are filled with... You'll find spiritually single or women that will come with their kids. You just don't find very seldom you find a man that will come and his wife's at home. I don't know. You just don't see that. Part of it might be the fatherless thing. I don't know, but I think it's as much because the woman is just more prone to be like that. Sociology questions, I don't know. But that would be kind of the thought. Other questions? We're busy people, no doubt. We're busy people. So some would say, and Matt, that's part of leadership. I think, guys, you have to, you have to control the schedule. Sometimes you have to say, no, you know, some, we're, we're doing too much. We've got <clears throat> kids are doing this, we're doing this. I've got this class, you've got this class. You're working here, I'm doing this. And sometimes you have to say, wow, we're, we're doing too much. Every once in a while, I think you run into people that their schedules are just so crowded, they hardly have time to even interact. They just, they hardly see each other. So that can happen too. Okay, Let's, uh, let me close in prayer and then we'll take a little break. Father, thank you for, <clears throat> Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for the reminder to all of us men that um, all the gifts that you've given to us, you've still placed us first in our family. So Lord, I pray that you give each one of these guys here the, the, um, the desire. I pray that your spirit would work on their hearts to help them say, yeah, I want to step up and uh, want to be the leader in my home. And that doesn't mean I have to know more than my wife, but I do need to be the leader. So I'd give them impetus to do that. And give them uh, courage to step up and uh, even just say, can I pray with you? Uh, to know what step forward they need to take. I just pray that you would do that for their benefit, for their wise benefits, for their kids, and uh, thought that you'd shape them that way. Pray in your name. Amen.